curious people. If we caught you willing to share a few minutes together, first of all I want to thank you for continuing to watch this channel. And if you like what we do here, please subscribe, it's a huge help for us. Today begin a three-episode series about the 19th-century Insane Asylum's nightmare. Insane asylums were once seen as symbols of progress for people with mental health issues. But by the 19th and 20th centuries, these institutions had become overcrowded torture chambers. These facilities catered to mentally ill people with treatments that were supposed to be more humane than what was previously available. But mental health stigmatization coupled with an increase in diagnosis led to severely overcrowded hospitals and increasingly cruel behavior toward patients. These insane asylums subsequently turned into prisons where society's undesirable citizens the incurables criminals and those with disabilities were put together as a way to isolate them from the public. Patients endured horrifying treatments like ice baths, electric shock therapy, purging, bloodletting, straitjackets, forced drugging, and even lobotomies, all of which were considered legitimate medical practices at the time. It wasn't until the terrifying conditions at these mental health facilities were revealed through undercover investigations and patient witnesses that they were brought to light. In 1851, Isaac Hunt, a former patient at the main insane hospital, sued the facility, describing it as the most iniquitous spill in a system of inhumanity that would more than match the bloodiest, darkest days of the Inquisition or the tragedies of the Bastille. But not all former patients were lucky enough to get out, as Hunt did. Take a look at the most infamous insane asylums from centuries past and the horrors that once took place inside their walls. Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. Mental health haven turned lobotomy lab. From the outside, the facade of the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum looks almost magnificent, with tall brick walls and an elegant bell tower on top. But the remnants of its abusive past still linger inside. The Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum first opened in 1863 in West Virginia. It was the brainchild of Thomas Kirkbride, an American mental health reformist working to improve patient treatments. Kirkbride had advocated for more holistic treatment of mental health patients, which included access to fresh air and sunlight within a healthy and sustainable environment. The 250-bed facility was a sanctuary when it first began operating. It featured long spacious hallways, clean private rooms, and high windows and ceilings. The grounds had a sustainable dairy, a working farm, waterworks, a gas well, and a cemetery. But its idyllic days didn't last very long. About 20 years after it opened, the facility began to become overwhelmed by patients. An increase in both mental health diagnosis and stigma surrounding those conditions led to a major uptick. By 1938, the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum was six times over capacity. Given the severe overcrowding, Patients were no longer given private rooms of their own and shared a single bedroom with five to six other patients. There were not enough beds and there was no heating system. Patients deemed unruly were locked in cages in the open halls, a cruel means to regain order by the staff, while freeing up space in the bedrooms for less troublesome patients. The staff was vastly outnumbered and overworked, which led to chaos in the halls as patients roamed free with little supervision. The facilities were overrun with squalor, the wallpaper was torn, and the furniture was grimy and dusty. Much like the facilities, the patients were no longer cared for frequently and sometimes even went without treatment or food. At its peak in the 1950s, the hospital housed 2,600 patients ten times the number it was intended to serve, and in addition to the facility's declined sanitation and patient care, a new horror reared its head an experimental lobotomy laboratory run by Walter Freeman, the infamous surgeon who was a top proponent of the controversial practice. His ice pick method involved slipping a thin pointed rod into the patient's eye socket and using a hammer to force it to sever the connective tissue in the brain's prefrontal cortex. It's unclear exactly how many victims suffered at Freeman's hands, but it's estimated that he carried out a total of 4,000 lobotomies in his lifetime. His lobotomies left many patients with lasting physical and cognitive damage, and some even died on the operating table. 
the abuse and neglect of patients inside the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum remained largely unknown to the public until 1949, when the Charleston Gazette reported on the terrifying conditions. Shockingly, it continued its operations until 1994, when the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum was finally shut down forever. Today, the manor-like facility is a museum of sorts. Exhibits in the Kirkbride the main building of the asylum include art made by patients in the art therapy program, treatments of the past including straitjackets, and even a room dedicated to restraints. Visitors can also take a so-called paranormal tour, where devout ghost hunters swear they can hear echoes of terrors gone by. Willard Asylum for the Chronic Insane. A sad memorial of forgotten patients. One of the eeriest landmarks of upstate New York is probably one you've never heard of. It is the abandoned Willard Asylum for the Chronic Insane, a sprawling facility that once housed the most vulnerable members of society. Mental health patients. The Willard Asylum was among the growing number of mental health care facilities opening up around the country in 1869. Mental health advocates like New York Surgeon General Sylvester Willard were pushing for state-run facilities that would provide mental health patients with more humane treatments. Back then, it was common for people diagnosed with mental health conditions to be bound up and chained like animals in almshouses or shelters. Willard's idea for a special facility where mental health patients were looked after by the state was approved by President Abraham Lincoln, who signed off on the proposal for Willard Asylum six days before his assassination. The hospital featured impressive amenities like a movie theater, a gymnasium, arts and crafts classes, and even a bowling alley. It was a place where mental health patients could really focus on recovery at least in the beginning. Mary wrote, a woman who suffered from dementia and spent 10 years in a county poorhouse chained to her bed, was the first patient at the Willard Asylum for the Chronic Insane. With quality care facilities and the staff that treated her with respect, Rhodes' condition improved dramatically. But the field of psychiatry was still backward in its approach toward many patients, and not everyone was as lucky as wrote. Joseph Lobdell was a trans man who was committed to the Willard Asylum for a rare form of mental disease, as his doctor wrote. Back then, society had little understanding of trans people, and Lobdell's identity was dismissed as a mental illness. Sadly, he remained at the hospital for 10 years before he was transferred to another facility, where he stayed until his death. Patient treatments that are now known to be harmful such as electroconvulsive therapy, ECT, and ice baths, were still deployed at the hospital. Even more terrifying is the fact that the hospital had a policy that did not permit a patient's release until it was approved by administrators. Some patients remained stuck in the asylum for decades or even died there. It was finally shut down for good in 1995. The site is now abandoned, though some parts are currently being reused as training facilities and dorms by the New York Department of Correctional Facilities. Danvers Lunatic Asylum. The notorious Hell House on the Hill. Looking at it today, one would never believe that the Gothic-style stately building atop a hill in Danvers, Massachusetts, was once a notorious mental health institution. The Danvers State Lunatic Asylum later rebranded as the Danvers State Hospital had a reputation of oppressive treatments and abuse so severe that horror writer H.P. Lovecraft used it as a setting in his work, fictionalizing it as Arkham Asylum. DC Comics also latched onto the Institute's terror-filled past by creating their own Arkham Asylum, which served as a backdrop for the ultra-psychotic villains in the Batman universe. This was quite the fitting connection given the Institute's original design from above looked like a bat in mid-flight, a design that was supposed to help draw in a breeze through the entire facility. But the horrors at the Danvers State Insane Asylum weren't made up like stories in comics they were real. At first, the state lunatic hospital at Danvers seemed to be on the right path. The idea was that the facility, which was made up of at least 40 separate buildings, would be self-sustaining with several treatment amenities on site. It was opened in 1878 and meant to serve 450 patients, but as mental health diagnoses grew in the late 19th century, so too did the demand for facilities like the State Lunatic Asylum, and at its peak, the hospital held more than 2,000 patients. 
overcrowding quickly led to a decline in cleanliness and sanitation. Patients were reportedly left running around naked and lived in their own filth. And brutal treatment methods such as lobotomies were enacted by the staff. At the time, doctors believed lobotomies could rid the mind of sickness, even though in many cases the procedures left patients in worse states than before, and sometimes they even led to death. The abysmal conditions at the Danvers State Insane Asylum spoke for itself. A total of 278 people died at the hospital in 1939 alone. The mistreatment and abuse at Danvers continued until 1985 when most of the facility was shut down. But the asylum wasn't fully closed until 1992. The property has since become a popular site for thrill-seekers looking for supernatural encounters, and in 2005, large portions of the rundown property were torn down and rebuilt into apartments. This is the end of the first part and I hope you enjoy it. Now if you want to get others to find out what I'm doing here. I'll tell you very honestly, a share will not only help, but will also be greatly appreciated. The second part will appear next week. And if you want to be sure that you don't miss anything, of course, only if I convinced you that it's worth it, it would help me to subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. Thank you.